All right. Our next speaker, we're going to talk about surgery here, cardiopulmonary bypass. Dr. Walter O'Hara, it's great to have you here. So cardiopulmonary bypass in 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm giving this talk to you guys. Uh, you're you're going to be cardiologists or so to be cardiologists. So I'm a surgeon. There's not a, uh, I'm a younger quote unquote surgeon. Um, it's interesting, the, the time we live in, you guys are going to be working more with us as a team. This is how we're going to do it. So you got to learn to get along. I'm, I'm, I'm of the type that let's get along, OK? So let me just give you the, the facts here. Um, 1931, Dr. DeBakey develops the uh, continuous roller pump. And it's mainly for blood transfusion and things. If you wiki this, which I did, Dr. DeBakey did this. We're, we're in Houston now. This is what happened. I don't know what all the other stuff is. So there's a bunch of other stuff talking about who did it, where it was done, whatever. Um, so and look, he did it in medical school. This is amazing. Dr. DeBakey invented a roller pump while he was in medical school. So think about that. Um, then later, John Gibbons uh, develops the uh, cardiopulmonary bypass machine with IBM. Um, and what's interesting about the surgical history is is that he does ASD repairs. I think he did about five or seven. I think his mortality rate was 50%. And he said, I'm done. He, he bowed out. He was done doing that. So somebody else picked up the ball, DeWall and Lily High, and they developed this helical reservoir, which is the early bubble oxygenator. And then later on, DeWall develops the shell oxygenator. So these, the, the cardiopulmonary bypass machine was this giant machine that they rolled in. I had professors when I was in CV training were saying, oh, yeah, we had to come in early. We had to load the pump with blood, with blood. Can you imagine? They would pour the blood in and prime it and get it all ready, and that would they'd come in an hour early to do that. Unbelievable. Totally different now. The machine is totally shrunk down, and the things we do are amazing. But uh, this is the history of it. Um, and just a schematic. So the venous cannula is here. You have cannulas, tubing, and some pumps. I'll show you. So there's a venous cannula, an arterial cannula here. Tubing, you have a reservoir. Then the centrifugal pump is, is here. It pulls the blood out and pushes it through the membrane oxygenator and the heat exchanger, uh, and then through a filter so we don't give anybody strokes. Back through here, and then back up to the uh, most time ascending aorta. So a quick overview of what we actually do. We anticoagulate in the cannulation uh, strategies, uh, venous reservoir, I'll show you the pump heads, oxygenator integrated heat exchanger, which is kind of all one unit now, and it's really small. And then cardioplegia, because once we get on bypass, we want to stop the heart, and then we can have a bloodless field and operate. This is, these are the, uh, there's a better picture of it here. So these are the pumps that DeBakey invented up here. The, the bypass, the, the, the centrifugal pump is actually very small nowadays. It's like this big. Um, here's the, the, the venous reservoir oxygenator, and then down here is where the heat exchanger is. And you know that because these big black tubes fill with water, and they go back over here. And it's a machine. It's amazing. You just got a new one where I am. It's about as big as a, a box, and it sits over the side. It makes a lot, the most noise of anything. But that, you, cha you can change the patient's temperature by telling the perfusionist, oh, go up, go down, I want to be at 35, whatever you want to be. So the water comes through here. It doesn't touch the blood, but it warms or cools the blood, whatever you need to do. So anticoagulation. I love it when nursing students come in the room because I say, all right, we're giving heparin. I take my mammary down. We're giving heparin. Um, 300 to 400 units. That's 30,000 to 50,000 units of heparin that I'm giving. So when I get calls from nurses and they say, can I give this 5,000 units of heparin, Dr. O'Hare? I say, why well, certainly you can. It's DVT prophylaxis, it's nothing. We're given, and what I like, if, there's a couple of points that, as cardiologists that I want you to take home. This is one of them. We give 50, a big giant guy, we give 50,000 units of heparin. Patient's got a sternotomy, it's all opened up. They do not exsanguinate on the table. They do just fine. And, and they're not bleeding from everywhere. It, it, it's, it's really remarkable. I mean, we have a bovie and everything, so when you guys are doing catheters and everything, you can, you know, you can be reasonable about it, but I'm saying we use, a, we use whopping amounts of heparin. So our ACT is above 400 before I even stick the cannula in. I, I ask, I always, I touch the aorta, and then if it's, if it's not calcified and ready to cannulate, I always ask, 
what's the ACT? Because I've already, they've already given the heparin. We've already got our first ACT before I put the cannula in. And it's always above 400. And then we check it every 30 minutes, and it has to be above 400. And they take care of that, the perfusionist and the anesthesiologist. And then when I finish the operation, I'm coming off bypass. And then you give the protamine 1 to 1.5 per 100 units. So it's, just, it's whopping uh, doses of heparin. So arterial cannulation um, for, for cabbage, which is mainly what I do, is send an aorta. Um, but you can, you can cannulate the arch. If, you, if it's calcified, you go a little higher. Uh, descend an aorta. I haven't done that very often. An ominate artery. So with dissections and things nowadays, we're using subclavian and axillary arteries. So you cannulate over here. Um, and that way, you can perfuse the, uh, the arch anagrade. Um, and then femoral artery. Same thing for minimally invasive, you stay out of the, you're making small incisions, you don't want a bunch of cannulas coming out, you femorally cannulate uh, arterially. Um, here's a just picture of different cannulas. So another thing to take away is the big cannulas, those are arterial and venous. The biggest one is the venous. Um, the smaller cannulas are cardiopegia cannulas. So this cannula right here, let's start with this one. This one is the arterial cannula. Then you have the venous cannula here, and then another venous cannula here, which is the schematic is kind of bad. It's not really connected to anything, but that's probably from a femoral. Um, and then the smaller cannulas, this is a, in the ascending aorta. This is the anagrade cardioplegia cannula, and this is a retrograde going through the atrium in the coronary sinus and a little balloon so that it only goes one direction. So the big cannulas are for the cardiopulmonary bypass machine. The small cannulas are for uh, cardioplegia. This is a what I call a redo cannula, but it's actually a femoral cannula. You can do it uh, percutaneously if you like, or with a little stab incision in the groin, or I, I use this on my redos because it's over a wire. Um, and then this showing um, a balloon clamp. You put this in, so back when Hartport was around, you, you would do a, uh, a percutaneous stick in the groin and put this up, and then you blow this balloon up in the aorta so that way, you, again, you, when you're doing minimally invasive, you don't have a whole bunch of uh, gear in your way to look, look at the heart. Um, venous cannulation, two, two things to remember. Single or double, uh, so single stage, dual stage. Um, and let me just show it to you, it's easier. Dual stage, the holes at the, en at the end and on the sides. So that way here, you. The, the, the blood can get out of the heart because you're sucking the blood out this way, and then below in the inferior vena cava. That way you have a collapsed heart and blood free field. If you're a single stage, these are old ones here, they're metal, but you can use these and they're angled, and I use these for mitral valves. And then what you do is they only have holes at the, at the end, single stage, right? So then you snare down the, uh, put ramels and umbo tapes around the superior and inferior vena cava and snare those down. And that way, all the blood is coming. Um, you're taking it from the inferior and, and, and superior. And then you, then you can either go through the right atrium, or you can go through the left atrium. Um, and if you get in the right atrium, there's not a bunch of blood that piles back. If we did it the other way, this, you'd, you'd have blood coming out, and you'd be sucking air. So you wouldn't want to do that. Um, so and then newer cardiopulmonary bypass instruments that we have. And this is more heart port stuff. And this is what I showed you in that other picture. Was this, this is the aortic clamp from the femoral. You can put in a sump and then a, a, pulm, a, a retrograde catheter, which is done through like an IJ stick. And this is showing a venous cannula from the groin. Um, and then the arterial cannula from the groin is right here, or the arterial uh, clamp here. Um, but what's interesting is that a lot of anesthesiologists doing these, and they can become very facile at putting in uh, retrograde and sumps through doing TE. And everybody does TE now. So um, I do TE on every single cabbage I do. I mean, does it help? I, th I think it helps coming off bypass. You look at the ventricle and see how it, it looks. Um, and then you can look, look, look at other things. But every single time, does it help? No. But I think it adds, definitely adds to the case. Um, venous reservoirs. So really, the venous reservoirs, the one I use looks like this. There are some like these I haven't really seen. Um, and the interesting thing about this is, is that you always have to have a certain amount. And they like two or 300 in there. And your perfusionist will tell you. They'll be like, I need more volume. So you'll put the pump sucker over in the chest and try to pull some volume off. If, 
if it, if it goes below a certain, and they have alarms and everything, it'll suck air, and you, and you don't want that to happen. So they, they can put volume in there and add volume as needed. They can add blood. We don't usually do that. Or add albumin, add just saline. But you need to keep a certain amount of volume in here. And they, every, every perfusionist has a certain their number that they will, will live with or won't. So two types of pumps, really. This is the roller head, afterload independent, and then the centrifugal pump, which is uh, afterload uh, dependent. So um, this is the one that DeBakey developed. Um, it gives you kind of a peristaltic motion. It just kind of runs around it. And so that's used for the sump, which is in the aorta, the uh, pump sucker. And, that, so you can, and the, the perfusionist is controlling this a, a, as needed. The centrifugal pump, so it sucks in here. You have a, a impeller that pulls the blood in and pushes it out. And then we have an ultrasonic flow sensor that just tells you how much we're flowing. And we try to get an index around two. So um, Houston people are, actually, I'm in Baytown, so people are pretty big. Um, so we're, sometimes we're flowing at, my highest has been six, but they, they, their flow at anywhere from four to six liters a minute. So you just try to, uh, the, the, the perfusionist, is, you're constantly talking to them and the anesthesiologist. Oxygenator and uh, heat exchanger. So this is the biggest thing I think that's changed. Is it used to be this big old contraption, and now it's just a little thing we throw away afterwards. So it's pretty amazing. Um, uh, porous fibers. Um, there's not blood, direct blood contact. Of course, fixed laws. You put the gas over top of it. Um, let me just sh so show it to you. So it comes in from the bottom and then goes through the heat exchanger first. And then so you have water coming in and water coming out. And you, like I said, you have a little heater cooler over on the side, and that you, you, you change the temperature of the water, whatever you need. You're going on bypass, you cool somebody down to like 35, 34, and then when you say, okay, I'm finished my mammary, got two proximals to do, warm the patient, and then they warm them back up again, and they just change the temperature of that water. And then the, the blood goes back up through here, through these porous membranes, and the gas comes in through here, and the blood is oxygenated, and then push, pu pushed out. Um, Oh, this is a more intricate picture of it. The same kind of thing, though. Heat exchanger on the bottom, on the, on the top is the oxygenator. So a little more complex than that I want to show you. And this is just to show you that the anesthesiologist um, controls the amount of oxygen. They're taking blood gases probably every half an hour. Um, and anesthetic, too. So I had, when I was in, my, my past job was in Wichita, Kansas, the, the anesthesia would always stay in the room. But when I was in Macon, Georgia, where I trained um, in Mississippi, people, the, the anesthesiologists would leave the room. You'd go on bypass, and they would just go, call me when you're coming off bypass. Because the perfusionist is in control of the heart, lungs. They give anesthetic. They give pain medicine. They can do everything. So some places, they, uh, they walk out of the room. But some places, they don't. And the anesthesiologists didn't like that when I said, yeah, you can just leave the room. They, they were like, no, I'm going to stay. So anyway, so they, ha they have total control. Um, so last, so you get the patient on bypass, and you do all, you know, you have to have control. So now you can, uh, you want to stop the heart, you give antegrade and retrograde. I give uh, <clears throat> a boatload of cardioplegia. Uh, and it protects the myocardium. It's by uh, potassium, um, and it stops the heart and diastole. So diastole, the heart is very flaccid. It's just loose, and you can move it all around. And counter-distinction to stop it in systole, and you get a stone heart. And I've been told that when they first started doing cardioplegia, uh, the, the uh, research on it, they stopped the heart in, of animals in systole, and it was a disaster because it's just a rock, and you can't get it to start back up again. So it's in diastole. It's a bloodless feel. It's very easy to manipulate around. Um, and it's kind of hibernated, I tell my students, is that it's hibernated less ATP production, and, and you cool the patient down, so you're, you're stopping the metabolism. So here's the antegrade and, and retrograde, and there's different ways. So th I mean, this picture is just showing a mitral valve approach. You have dual uh, venous cannulation. You're opening up the roof of the left atrium. Antegrade cardioplegia, um, and no retrograde. Um, this one's showing antegrade here and retrograde going into the coronary sinus. Um, and then um, more about where you can give cardioplegia, retrograde, coronary sinus, 
most common uh, potassium is the big uh, component of it. And I think I have one more picture of. <clears throat> so the, in this picture, just to show you that you're doing an aortic valve and you need to get cardioplegia, you can give it in the coronary os. Here's the right coronary and the left coronary. Um, and this is the surgeon's approach, uh, what it looks like. And so you have these little cannulas that you just stick into the os and you can give cardioplegia and I give it every 15 minutes. So my normal, what I do, I go on bypass, I, I clamp, arrest the heart with uh, um, 300 of antegrade, 300 of warm antegrade, 300 of cold antegrade, and then 300 of warm retrograde. I mean, cold retrograde, sorry. So um, it's about 900 to 1,200 cc's of cardioplegia. By that time, the heart's arrested, and then you can operate. Um, and I usually give it every 15 minutes. Um, I believe that's it. That's a quick rundown.